Mr. Mr. Prime Minister, does it work? No. Hello. Yeah. You can hear me? It's okay? Yeah. Can you fix it during my speech for the Prime Minister, please? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will start. Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Ambassadors, uh, dear Arantxa Gonzalez, or Dean of PSIA, dear friends, first of all, I would like really to thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for being with us today. Your visit to Sciences Po is an honor for our communities, the communities of teachers, of students. Your presence in the context of the French presidency of the Council of the European Union is an excellent example of the tremendous ties our two countries have built. Currently, France is the fourth scientific partner of your country. As a university specialized in so social sciences, Sciences Po is proud to play its part in this strong relationship between France and the Netherlands, especially thanks to seven partnerships with top-ranked Dutch universities, including the University of Amsterdam and including Maastricht University. This year, as you know, 97 Dutch students are studying in Sciences Po. Prime Minister Rutte, we note that your government is placing a priority on the importance of both Europe and on education, with, in particular, a significant investment of 5 billion euros in higher education over the next 10 years, and also on a focus on equal opportunities. And as you know, we are sharing at Sciences Po these two priorities. Since the end of World War II, diplomatic agreements have been key to maintaining lasting peace in the world, and NATO is obviously part of that. After the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian government, today's diplomatic context highlights the role of international agreements as well as the role and responsibilities of the European Union in such a period of time. The role of universities, especially Sciences Po and other European universities, is really key. As so many universities around the world, Sciences Po has been active since the beginning of the tragic attacks on Ukraine. Our communities, our students, our teachers are fully mobilized to provide assistance and support. Since its foundation 150 years ago, Sciences Po has played an important role in international peace, cooperation, and academic freedom. Our DNA, the DNA of Sciences Po, aims to promote human rights. In this context, it is our duty to host visiting researchers and students from Ukraine under the POST program and under our Welcome Refugees program. In these difficult times, Sciences Po will continue to fulfill its role as an open and international university, and your presence today, Mr. Prime Minister, is a great example of that very purpose. Thank you. Well, Mr. President, Madam Dean, uh, it is a real honor uh, to be here uh, at Sciences Po, at this esteemed university, and I stand here with a high sense of urgency. Uh, because uh, students, ladies and gentlemen, uh, can I say young Europeans, I want to talk to you today. I want to talk to you about Europe, about European cooperation, and about our transatlantic alliance. No theoretical debates or technical discussions today, but fundamentals, peace, freedom, and security on our continent. For the vast majority of Europeans, these have been certainties for the past 75 years. A major war in Europe in the 21st century seemed inconceivable. But that illusion was shattered with the act of unprecedented aggression in the night of the 23rd to the 24th of February. Because then, 
the unthinkable, unthinkable became thinkable, and the impossible possible. War has returned to Europe. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a new chapter in world history has begun. One of the darkest in our continent's history since the end of the Second World War. Putin's regime has cast a shadow of malice, revanchism, and revisionism over Europe. Ukraine, a free and democratic country, has been attacked without provocation or justification. Ukrainian cities are being bombed and besieged as we speak. Ukrainian civilians driven out, wounded and killed. It's shocking, terrifying and simple criminal. As we meet here today in Paris, the city of Liberté, Égalité, a Fraternité, our thoughts are with Ukraine and our hearts go out to its people. From this place, I say to them, we are with you. Europe is with you. We are family. And we will provide shelter for Ukrainians who have fled their country. Ladies and gentlemen, I will know I must begin my speech with the words of President Volodymyr Zelensky, one of the bravest people I ever met. In one of his video messages from a Kiev under fire, he made clear that Russia's aggression is more than an invasion of Ukraine. It is also, and I quote, the beginning of a war against Europe, against basic human rights in Europe, against European unity, against all rules of coexistence and on the continent, against the fact that European countries refuse to divide borders by force. When bombs fall on Kiev, this is happening in Europe. When missiles kill our people, this is the death of all Europeans. Hard words, but true. And a message that resonates especially strongly in France, the country of the Enlightenment, of brilliant minds like Montesquieu and Voltaire, a country of revolutionary ideas, separation of powers, tolerance of dissent, freedom of opinion, values that make up the foundation of our modern Western societies, soft values in a hard, uncompromising world. By invading Ukraine, Putin has put all that at risk. In the words of President Emmanuel Macron, he, who is also an alumnus of this distinguished university, democracy has been called into question right before our eyes. Our freedom and the freedom of our children are no longer a given. Yes, it is a loud wake-up call. Russia has willingly ignored diplomacy at every turn. It was simply beyond our powers of, of imagination. And we failed to see it for what it really is. Pure aggression that will not stop if left unchecked. There is no denying it now. We have to face the ugly truth and turn our fear, anger and disgust into action to de-escalate the situation and restore peace in Europe, acting with resolve and reason, and responding to the geopolitical sea change unfolding before our own eyes. For politicians, that means focusing above all on our primary task, keeping our countries and our continent safe. We must do that together within the framework of the European Union and the framework of the transatlantic relationship within NATO. International structures that make us safer and more stable. Confronted by the threat we now face, it is our solemn duty to make these two organizations that are essential to Europe even stronger. With fresh ideas and flexible thinking, free of all taboos and fixed dogmas. And today, I'd like to suggest some ways we can do that. And let me begin with the European Union. 
Our response as European Union to the Russia's aggression has been resolute, unified, and determined. We have shown that we are capable of taking a stand. But we have to follow through. We have been given a final warning. This is the time to act. We have to enhance our open strategic autonomy, something France has been urging for a long time, to be able to defend ourselves and our way of life. Incorporation and therefore open with our democratic partners around the world. We need to be less dependent on Russian gas and less vulnerable in the digital domain. To make our economy strong enough to take a hit and put our house in order. And that starts in the European Union with the foundation, our economy, our most powerful weapon. Europe's combined economic power is immense, and so is the potential leverage it gives us on the world stage. For example, in imposing sanctions. That works best if our economies are at peak fitness. But they aren't. Economic growth is sluggish, and our debt burden is too high. The only remedy is structural reforms. The Covid Recovery Fund is the perfect opportunity. For the first time ever, and can I say also thanks in part to Dutch efforts, financial support has been linked to necessary reforms. And that is a winning combination. Linking investment with structural reforms will make our economies fundamentally stronger. The same goes for our fiscal rules, which can also be linked to reforms. Countries that reform their economies would then get more time to reduce their debt. And those that fail to meet the agreements would be subject to stricter enforcement by the European Commission. This will make our economies more robust and more competitive. It will create jobs and prosperity and maximize Europe's influence on the world stage. But our strong position in the world is undermined by our energy dependence. Of course, also by our digital, digital vulnerability. We can't do without Russian gas at the moment. And that plays into Putin's hands. The Russians are masters at the game of pipeline politics, which allows them to keep a foot in Europe's door. And Russian aggression in Ukraine and rising energy prices are hitting us all in our wallets. This isn't new to us. We knew it. But we have dragged our feet for too long. Now is the time to find alternatives. Different providers, different sources, including nuclear energy, and advancing our green response. Investing in sustainable energy, like solar, wind, and hydrogen and linking up our energy networks and markets so that solar energy from Portugal can heat a school in Riga and wind energy from the North Sea can power a lamp in Athens. This is a win-win-win investment in our climate goals, in new technologies and jobs, and also in a stronger geopolitical position. The European Commission has just presented plans to speed up efforts in this area. There's no time to lose. Let's make it happen. And here we also need to reduce our digital vulnerability. The Russian invasion shows that we are facing hybrid threats these days. Alongside the conventional conflict, an information war is being waged. And cyber attacks are part of the enemy's arsenal. We need to be able to withstand threats like these and reduce our dependence on others. And for that reason, I applaud the comprehensive EU CHIPS Act presented recently by the Commission. Its aim is to bolster our own semiconductor industry. At the same time, we must continue to look beyond our borders and seek cooperation with other democratic partners. 
So we need to create a democratic alliance with partners in the US, South Korea, and Japan to stop our advanced technologies falling into the wrong hands and to keep production lines open in times of crisis. We must work together globally to ensure our digital autonomy. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot keep our continent safe on our own. We are protected by NATO, our transatlantic alliance, and the most powerful military partnership in world history. This is and will remain the cornerstone of Europe's security. For a long time, we have leaned on the broad shoulders of our strongest ally, the United States. But now, as European allies, we must do more ourselves. Invest more in our defense. Increase our deterrence capability. Prepare our armed forces to counter new threats. Work harder to foster military cooperation between European allies and between the EU and NATO. So we can be stronger partners within NATO and in that way fortify the alliance as a whole. Not everyone needed a wake-up call. For the Baltic states and countries like Poland, the need for robust armed forces was never in doubt. And this country, France, too, has always been a leader in calling for better European cooperation on defense. Now we are all going the extra mile. Germany has taken, only a week ago, a remarkable step financially and in its thinking by making an additional investment of 100 billion euros in its armed forces. It is also supplying weapons to Ukraine. Chancellor Olaf Scholz called it eine Cäsur, a turning point in Germany's foreign policy. The significance of this shift cannot be overstated. In the Netherlands too, when the new government took office earlier this year, the coalition agreed to increase the defense budget by 25%. And we are looking at what else is needed now that the security situation in Europe has changed dramatically over the past few weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has plunged Europe into a new era of uncertainty. We don't know where Russia's aggression will end. And we don't know what the implications will be for our continent. But we must do everything we can to keep Europe's future in our own hands. We must work to ensure a resilient European Union and a powerful NATO alliance, standing strong on the world stage for our norms and values, shoulder to shoulder with our European family in these most difficult of times. My friend on the European Council, Emmanuel Macron, is taking the lead in this regard. I admire his courage, his energy, and his ability to imbue Europe with the strengths of France's renowned diplomacy and armed forces. So I'd like to close with a notable quote from his recent address to the nation. On the Russian invasion of Ukraine, he said, it is a turning point in the history of Europe, and there will be a long-lasting, profound consequence on our life and the geopolitics, geopolitics of the continent. The ghosts of the past are rising again, but we will not give up one iota of our unity or the principles of liberty, sovereignty, and democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to send that message loud and clear within Europe and from Europe to the world. Thank you.
Of course, I'm extremely anxious about this moment because you are all so informed. <laughs> so I hope to learn from you. <laughs> Um, as one of the Dutch students at Sciences Po, allow me to say welcome. Thank you. It is an enorme eer om u te mogen ontmoeten. Thank you for your time. Um, then, for my question, I'm wondering: uh, the European Union has sanctioned Russia. We have sanctioned Belarus, which has been complicit in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, let me make it clear: what do you say to countries like China, which, though not directly involved, are very much enabling Russia to continue its operations and to evade the sanctions that are meant to stop them from continuing these operations. Thank you. Yes, yeah, a very good question. And uh, of course, China abstained in the Security Council, uh, where Russia voted against uh, the resolution uh, which uh, made clear that this aggression was not tolerated, and China abstained. But you're right, there are still intense dialogues between uh, China and Russia, and we are trying to um, uh, to liaise with the Chinese uh, from Europe, from the US, but also from other parts of the world, to have a very strong conversation on how they can put more influence on the situation in uh, Russia. At the moment, there are only a few leaders who speak with both presidents, uh, Putin and Zelensky. Of course, Macron and Schultz and Biden uh, from the European side and the, and the NATO side, but outside the West, it's the Prime Minister of Israel, the President of Turkey, and the Prime Minister of India. And I was yesterday on the phone with Narendra Modi and also asked him to see what he can do to make use of that um, uh, dialogue he has been having with both presidents uh, to, to, to bring forward the, uh, the chances for a peaceful, uh, de-escalated resolution uh, of this whole conflict. But coming back to China, uh, of course, um, we particularly call on them to make use of their enormous influence they have on affairs in, uh, in Russia uh, to steer uh, the situation in the right direction. They can do a lot. Thank right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman over there, if you could briefly uh, say who you are so that the Prime Minister knows uh, to whom uh, he's answering. Uh, my name is Martin van Rossum, also a Dutchman. Uh, you just said that... Uh, are there also non-Dutch in the... <laughs> because I, then I could have delivered the speech in Dutch. No. Uh, you just called the EU COVID recovery fund a great success. And now President Macron and the European Commission are suggesting issuing new European bonds to uh, fund the fallout of uh, the Ukrainian war, especially seeing that they will be unequally divided between European countries. And I read this morning at Politico that the Netherlands is hesitant. Why so? Yes, well, these ideas have not been uh, articulated completely from, from various countries. Everyone is thinking about what can we do uh, to solve the situation. France is thinking about proposals, uh, we are thinking about proposals. One of the reasons I'm in Paris, well, the reason I'm in Paris, of course, is this speech. But there's also <laughs> another reason, that is that we have the first uh, cabinet-to-cabinet -cabinet meeting between the Netherlands and, and France uh, uh, today, later in the Elysee. Uh, and, and there's a historic moment, we never had a, a intense dialogue at the cabinet level like that uh, for the first time uh, today, uh, where we also will no doubt discuss what we can do. Uh, I think at the moment, in the existing uh, next-gen EU fund, uh, there is still a lot of money, which is also uh, partly funneled uh, towards greening our economies, and that's exactly what we need to do to become less gas and oil dependent. Um, of course, the problem is with uh, the next-gen EU fund that it is also money from the north, from countries like the Netherlands and Germany, to countries like Spain and Italy, who had to invest more in their economies to get out of the COVID crisis. And I thought it was ex ex entirely justifiable, but particularly because it is connected to reforms uh, in economies like Spain, Portugal and Italy, and they are implementing at the moment uh, those reforms. But it also means that we are spending 20 billion and getting back about four to five billion, which again is justifiable because of the COVID crisis. But now at this moment, uh, also the Netherlands and other countries have to look into their purse, what they need to do to make sure with the rising energy prices, the rising demands for investments in defense, 
uh, and all the other issues confronting us, and of course uh, speeding up the greening of our economies. Uh, so I would say let's make first use of the existing instruments to the max, and, and keep on dialoguing about what we need to do more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's take uh, over there and then... Uh, my name is Philip Veldkamp. Uh, I'm from The Hague as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've never seen this many Dutch nationals in one room. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned in Parliament uh, to Peter Omzicht that uh, you were preparing to phase out uh, imports uh, of Russian energy, so gas and oil. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak towards the consequences that would have uh, in the Netherlands and also what measures uh, you will put in place or what measures you already have put in place. And also uh, we know that there's still a lot of gas under the ground in Groningen mm -hmm. and uh, I was wondering if you were uh, considering taking that out and uh, even though we just decided to stop doing that. Yeah, well, well, first of all, uh, I pleaded on Monday also in London, a uh, meeting with uh, Johnson and Trudeau, uh, the UK and Canadian Prime Ministers, for not going hastily in the direction of a complete ban on gas and oil from Russia, because we are very much dependent. That's the painful reality, that we are still very much dependent on that. And if we would all of a sudden uh, quit uh, importing gas and oil from Russia, it would have huge ramifications on all our economies, France, Germany, and Netherlands, but also on Eastern Europe, even up to Ukraine itself, uh, because we still have to find the diesel to uh, put in the trucks uh, which are driving into uh, Ukraine to help them as humanitarian support, medicines, etc. So it will have huge ramifications. Some of the refineries in Eastern Europe cannot overnight change to other uh, oil products. Um, so also the idea that we put pressure on Shell or Exxon uh, to stop using oil or gas from Russia, I think, is not wise. Of course, the Americans are less dependent uh, on oil and gas uh, from Russia, so they can take a different track here. I don't mind that. And uh, I agree with Johnson that, of course, over time, we also need to, be, need to become independent from Russian oil and gas. Uh, the, yesterday, there has been a new uh, plan presented by the Commission to, by the end of the year, reduce our gas dependency by, I think, two-thirds. That is a huge task to get there. Uh, I'm not sure we can get there, but we have to do everything in our power to make that happen. And the main instrument to that, of course, is uh, 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 to bring down the energy consumption if possible, but particularly also by speeding up all the plans in place uh, to um, uh, yeah, uh, make our economies less dependent on, on, uh, on carbon, less dependent on the traditional uh, fuel. That also includes, I'm afraid, for those who don't like it, nuclear. We decided to build a couple of extra nuclear power plants in the Netherlands. Uh, and I could imagine that Germany, for example, would rethink at the moment uh, the, the timing of their uh, atom uh, leaving the nuclear sector. So we have to see what happens. But I think everything now is up for grabs in that sense, no dogmas. We have to become less dependent on Russia and gas and oil as soon as possible. But not tomorrow. That's not possible. Thank you. Uh, the lady to the left. Hi, thank you very much for being us, with us here today. Um, I'm Elisa, I'm also from the Netherlands, of surprisingly. <laughs> Is there anyone not from the Netherlands? Well, I've seen some people, so I'm sure there are. Um, they're just hiding out there. Um, but um, I had a question on your point on being providing solidarity towards Ukraine and also equal opportunities. I've heard in some other countries, such as Austria, they're now launching this emergency collaboration between universities to let in Ukrainian students. We've seen their, well, the future they plan for themselves crumble down. What do you think the options are for such a corporation within the Netherlands? And are there already talks on such things? Well, what, what, we, what we decided yesterday is to trigger, trigger what is in the Dutch peak, uh, what we call a crisis mechanism. That means that government can speed up uh, all the processes to make sure we can deal with the uh, Ukrainian refugee, uh, the flow of refugees coming into uh, Europe and, and also ultimately into the Netherlands. At this moment, it is over a thousand, but we expect many more. Exactly for this point, uh, to make sure that we have in one team uh, education, including higher education, but also the health sector, uh, child support, um, housing, uh, so that we can make sure that we, um, uh, as speedily as possible and conveniently as possible, we can take care of the refugee flow. I didn't know of this, uh, of this initiative, so the team is making notes. <laughs> so let's, let's look into that. Uh, I think at this moment we need okay. all the brains in Europe, and if this is a good idea, 
uh, let's study it and, and, uh, and activate it. That's Thanks. good to hear. Thank yeah, you very great. much. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Duly noted, uh, Prime Minister. Yeah. Duly noted. <laughs> the man to the right. Yes. They're making no notes. No, no, they're. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, okay, perfect. Uh, I'm Justus Busch-Gnospers, yet another Dutch student. Uh, it's very nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. But I'm so proud that there are so many Dutch students here. And uh, <laughs> my uh, national security advisor, Jeffrey Van Leeuwen, is also an alumnus of this esteemed university. So uh, I would expect many Dutch people here, but uh, I'm really proud. Um, I would like to continue the conversation on the, the response to the refugees coming now, because I admire the Dutch government and the Dutch public's very welcoming stance towards these refugees. But I would call it a bit atypical, considering our response to other refugee crises over the past 10 years, with the Netherlands and Europe having a notable uh, strict policy for refugees. So I was just wondering, uh, in your opinion, why is the response so different right now, and how can we justify that? Yes, well, I think that the Netherlands has always been open to uh, um, refugees uh, coming from countries in crisis. But at the end, we also have to make sure that we can somehow absorb uh, the amounts. And for example, in 2015 and 2016, when we had this huge flow of people trying to get away from the Assad regime in Syria and coming particularly to Sweden, Germany and the Netherlands, there was a moment where society was at a certain point not able to, to absorb that many people and making sure that they uh, would have some sort of future in, uh, in the Netherlands. And of course, uh, there, there are limits to what we can do. Uh, Ukrainian refugees are not part of the asylum system. Uh, they can travel freely within Europe. Uh, we have many Ukrainians potentially at the moment already in the country uh, staying with family or friends. We call upon them to make themselves known so that we can take better care of them in terms of education and health and housing. Um, but they are not obliged uh, at this moment uh, to come to asylum centers. Uh, so in that sense, it is different uh, because of the association agreement and the visa liberalization with Ukraine. They can travel and the European Union has now also triggered uh, the crisis mechanism so they can stay for a year. They can, when we have cleared the last bureaucratic legal hurdle uh, the coming weeks, they can also start working. Children can go to school. So it is different from uh, uh, people coming from outside uh, the European continent uh, to the Netherlands. In that sense, there is a difference. Can I, can I respond? Please. Uh, yes. Because I think, yes, I legally... I saw in your eyes that you uh, thought, <laughs> what sorry. is this guy talking about? Legally, I agree, it's a very different situation because, of course, the, the freedom to travel within Europe is there. However, I would say the situation, because it's, it's still refugees coming, fleeing from an autocratic uh, regime often, or a threat, a direct threat, and who share the same values that we were talking about, of freedom and democracy. So, like, yes, the legal system, I think, is different, but not necessarily the situation, right? I'm just yeah. wondering what your thoughts are on no, that. No, in that sense, of course, you, you have a point. Uh, I think Ukraine is so close by, it feels like family. Uh, and when people come from other parts of the world, of course, we are also stand ready to help, um, but there is more of a cultural difference, etc. So that could, could take time for people to really uh, get acquainted to the Netherlands and get acquainted to our values. But at the same time, when you look at the Syrian refugee uh, people fleeing from Syria in, the, in 2015 and 16 and beyond, they have been extremely successful in most cases to integrate in that society, uh, to start businesses, to uh, become successful uh, in every sense uh, they can. I'm still teaching myself in, in, in a, in a in a, in a high school in The Hague on Thursday mornings, and that is in a, in a neighborhood where many uh, refugees coming out of, uh, for example, Syria are in that school. And I'm always amazed, also Afghanistan, amazed by the speed by which they are taking up, particularly the young uh, people between 10 and 20 years old, uh, how, how speedily they are they're able to, uh, yeah, to, to adjust themselves uh, to the Netherlands. And, and at the same time, we can still learn a lot from them because they have gone through a lot. Thank you. Um, the lady on the left. Uh, hello, and thank you for your speech. Ah, thank you. Yeah. I am Daniela. I am not Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I wanted to ask you... Because otherwise you would uh, put this whole school now in Amsterdam. <laughs> 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 it's, it's much to easier <laughs> than to stay in Paris. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you, like, in the light of the current events and with the talks of uh, EU expansion towards the East, with the um, accords that were signed by Ukraine and uh, Moldova to join the EU, 
how realistic are those accords and uh, if there is any chance of uh, Schengen expansion in the East also? Yes, the, 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 the bureaucratic answer is that uh, the um, membership application has been received and will be sent to the Commission for uh, to study it further and they will then come up with a first sort of recommendation. So that's the bureaucratic answer. Uh, the political answer is that I completely understand uh, that Ukraine uh, wants to become more integrated with the European Union. Um, but I think here you have to be careful uh, because it is a bureaucratic, tedious process. Um, there are many questions which have to be answered. It will take many years. So yesterday on the phone with uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, I, I, I told him, I said, I know your ambition for the short term, but this will not happen in the short term because this is a whole process taking many years. So let's see what we can do now and tomorrow and next week and next month to make sure that we make maximum use of the existing um, formats we have, like the association agreement. We can do much more, I think, if we are creative by somehow getting him and his team uh, uh, more dialoguing, at, at a, more than we're doing uh, currently uh, with the European Council. So there are many ways to do that. Um, and for Georgia and Moldova, of course, I understand that they're extremely worried at the moment, but there is still a difference, I believe, now between Ukraine, which is under full attack uh, of, um, uh, of Russia, and, and I would think it would be wiser also for the European Union to, on the one hand, uh, acknowledge the request from Ukraine, but then again, also be honest with them that this will not happen overnight and that this is a long process and an answer will take time. And on the other hand, Georgia and Moldova, uh, who are also, of course, highly worried, but not on the direct uh, aggressive attack now from Russia, luckily. And hopefully that will stay this way, and therefore we need to be very firm as Putin. Uh, and, and make a separation between Ukraine and Moldova and Georgia. I would think that will be uh, wise. And also, what about Schengen? What yes, well, about Schengen, are... uh, uh, Schengen ex uh, accession of Bulgaria, Romania, Croatia, that is all being debated. But here, it, it, you give the key to, the, to your front door to somebody else. So you have to be absolutely certain that all uh, the prerequisites are in place, uh, that that front door is well protected. Uh, and, and we have a process with Bulgaria and Romania and Croatia to check whether that is the case, whether they are able to join. Uh, and I think that will still take some time. Thank you very much. The lady on the right. Hello, uh, I'm also a Dutch student. I'm Bo uh, from Amsterdam. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, I had a question. And for uh, how long are you studying here? Uh, for one semester. One semester, so yeah. that's three, four months? Uh, yeah, f uh, four months. Yeah. So I'm uh, studying at the U University of Amsterdam normally. Great. Yeah, um, so I had a question because my uh, social media has been blowing up uh, about uh, a post by the VVD that um, refers to Ukrainians as real refugees. And um, I've seen a lot of commotion, uh, read a, uh, a lot of things about this, there's a lot of commotion about this because there's a clear sense of othering there. And I was wondering, um, building on what was said before by uh, the guy who spoke before me uh, about the double standards for refugees from Syria and Afghanistan, how do you think this looks and do you think this is, mo this is morally ethical? I, I, I think you're reading something in it which was not meant, but thanks for the feedback because mm -hmm. then maybe the way it was stated uh, was not clear enough. Um, um, what my party, so I'm putting my party hat on for, for one minute, what my party is saying that is that um, uh, the Netherlands should always be open for uh, refugees who uh, are trying to get away from attacks, aggression mm -hmm. and need our protection. And yes, the numbers are not unlimited. We also have to be, be honest that you cannot host everyone, uh, but you want to do that to the max what you can do as a, uh, as a society. But it also means that people coming to the Netherlands, for example, Morocco, uh, who cannot stay uh, because there is uh, no reason for them to be put under the protection of our asylum system, they have to go back. They have to return, uh, and we have to be clear about that. It's not easy, so we have still many Moroccans in the Netherlands who we cannot get back uh, to Morocco or to Tunisia or other countries. We are working intensely with those countries to be more successful in return policies. That's one of the reasons why we have to reform the European asylum system, that already at the border of the European Union, you can make this distinction between those who are under our, our asylum system, political refugees, and those who are coming here, for example, for economic reasons, and I completely understand that, but we cannot have that. We cannot uh, absorb 
those numbers and, and how to get them back, for example, to Morocco or Tunisia or other countries. And, and that is a difficult process. And, and that is a distinction. So it's not a distinction between a refugee from Syria or Ukraine. But it is a distinction between a refugee from Ukraine, Syria on the one hand, and Morocco on the other hand. May I respond to this? Please. Uh, that's not really what we see in the policy. Because the ne next Dutch government, uh, like this new government, the migration policy is stricter. Uh, there's less people gonna, that are able to come. And Europe is um, fending off its borders. There's many peop uh, people who die on the sea or who can't come. So we're keeping them away. While Ukrainians, they are in invited with open arms and they're helped. And mm -hmm. I don't know how, because what you say, it's, it's nice. It's, it's good, it's, it's morally just. But I think, uh, personally I think, that's not what we show in our policy. We don't echo that in our policy. Well, you're right to a certain extent that there is, of course, also another difference between somebody from Syria and Ukraine. My party's policy, and to a certain extent also of the government, is to, if possible, make sure that people get protected in the region. For example, the deal between the agreement between the European Union and Turkey in 2016, under the then German presidency of the rotating presidency of the council, uh, was tuned in the direction that uh, Syrian refugees would, be, uh, would get protection in the south of Turkey, and more than three million people have been, um, uh, yeah, have not been invited, but have somehow found a place there to live and, and, and to coexist with, with their Turkish uh, neighbors. Um, but of course, if you're saying uh, you want refugees, if possible, uh, to get protection in the region, for Ukraine, the region is us. <laughs> we are the region. Uh, France, uh, Germany, Netherlands, uh, also the United Kingdom, by the way. Uh, and I know that there are some issues at Calais still. So um, uh, at, at, we are the region, not, uh, we cannot ask anyone else to, to solve that. So in that sense, there is a difference between Syria and, and Ukraine. Uh, but there's no difference in terms of that both deserve our protection. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and I will look into the wording exactly of that policy and uh, to see whether... It should be more clear. Thanks. Thank you. The man on the uh, left. Goedendag, meneer. Uh, my name is Sven van Kerkvoorde. I'm Swedish and Dutch. Ah, um, so at least half. <laughs> <laughs> my question pertains to energy. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, that you were in favor of an improved interconnectivity in, across Europe. Um, I was wondering if you were also in favor of a revision of the treaties to make energy an exclusive competence of the European Union. And then, secondly, um, I am transmitting a question from my Opa in Wolfgang as well, who is asking why you seem to be reluctant to share Dutch gas with our European partners. Yes, on the second question, that's about uh, uh, the question of Groningen. Of course, in Groningen, to explain for those who are not uh, um, familiar with this, we have had many earthquakes. And one to 100,000 to 200,000 people are, under, are really in danger if he would pump up again uh, the volumes uh, in Groningen. And that's why we don't want to do that. We want to close the Groningen gas, gas field. But of course, there is still a lot of gas in that uh, gas field. And we have made clear that if anyone would like us to pump up more gas because it would lower the price of gas uh, at the world markets, we will not do that. Uh, if there would be one day a energy security issue in supply, even then we don't want to do it. But in a sort of last instance, you cannot guarantee that it will never happen. But it is extremely sensitive because the people in Groningen and therefore the whole country, because in, in that sense 70 million people live there, it is, it is our country. It is, it is, uh, and, and we are very worried about those earthquakes. So that's an extremely sensitive issue. So never for, for lowering gas prices. Ultimately, 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 you cannot guarantee that it will never be on the table if uh, the gas supplies to Europe would be uh, completely uh, stopped. I would not be in favor of putting energy completely at a European level. I'm a bit worried about the ideas of price caps. Uh, because price caps uh, might also um, somehow influence uh, the energy markets in a sense that, for example, LNG, um, uh, LNG uh, ships would sail away from Europe to, towards Asia because it would not any longer be profitable for them to, uh, uh, to get their stuff into Europe. So there are risks to price caps and intervening in the, in the energy market. I think as, as governments, we should, of course, uh, take care of uh, as much as possible and absorb 
uh, what is happening with the rising energy prices, completely it will be impossible, I think, because they are now so high. But to do maximum we can in terms of other instruments we have as governments to support uh, the energy bills of households and companies. Thank you. We're going Thank to take you. the last two questions, uh, gentleman on the right and then the gentleman on the left. Goedemorgen, meneer Rutte. Uh, Goedemorgen. Uh, I beg your pardon for being only half Dutch and half French. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, um, during the, the crisis, we've seen that the EU has proved its efficiency, and I was wondering uh, what we could do to maintain that, if in, uh, that if in efficiency in the post-crisis uh, era. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's an extremely uh, good question. Yeah, uh, 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 we had a meeting with the African Union uh, two weeks ago, uh, and I explained to many colleagues in Africa that they probably should not make the mistake we made in Europe uh, in, in the exact um, um, way we organized ourselves in the European Union. But of course, that has been the outcome of a process starting after the war. Uh, the Benelux was even founded in the war. It's older than the EU and the, and the European uh, steel and, uh, and coal community. And then, of course, the, the, the Treaty of Rome is in, in, in 1957 and moving forward the Maastricht Treaty and from the European community getting into the European Union. And over time, yeah, there has always been this idea of a parliament and, and a commission and, of course, a council. Uh, and, of course, there is total merit to that balance. But it makes decision making in Europe uh, extremely slow and, and bureaucratic, and at the same time, I've seen over the years that when there is a real crisis, we can speed up, uh, we can come together quickly and uh, then come to decisions, uh, uh, fast-tracking where that is necessary. So yeah, I think it will always be uh, like this, with 27 countries, and they all have the national parliaments, uh, and, and I, I am not in favor of a sort of European nation state uh, i think it is it is perfect as we have it sovereign states pulling together on on issues where they need to pull together in the european union and and but still being sovereign and proud nations themselves with their own parliaments i think it is the best system but it will always until uh, yeah a decision making which could be speedier but luckily if necessary we also sort of with the greek um, uh, financial crisis in 2011 and 2015, uh, and also at other moments we are able to uh, to speed up the decision making process. Thank you. And the last question. Okay. Um, uh, good morning, Prime Minister. Uh, my name is Andres. I'm from Venezuela, and um, um, I like to tell my friends that we do share a border with the EU country, which is <laughs> you guys. By Absolutely. The um, you are our biggest neighbor, bigger than uh, yes, Germany. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so my question was, considering going a bit outside of Europe itself, considering that the Dutch Caribbean is in some sort of degree somewhat dependent on the oil industry, how does the Dutch Caribbean's um, oil industry fit into the Netherlands energy uh, panorama on itself? And how would the sustainable goals of the Netherlands, of the mainland Netherlands, fit into, into the Caribbean? Thank you. Th th that's a very good question, and, and probably the answer, honest answer is not enough. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, these were former colonies, and they are now independent nations with their own parliaments and governments, but still within the kingdom of the Netherlands, so that is uh, Curaçao and Aruba. Uh, close to Venezuela and S uh, St. Martin, uh, which has a border with Saint Martin, the, the French part of the island uh, in the north. And then we have also three what we call um, uh, communities. Uh, so they are more directly governed from uh, The Hague, uh, one of them also to the north of uh, Venezuela being Bonaire. Uh, but Curaçao and Aruba are independent countries. So they decide on their own policies, except for foreign policy and defense. That is done at the kingdom level, but on all the other issues, they deal with, it, with their policies themselves. And uh, therefore, um, uh, it's not easy uh, to work on this. But again, second no, no, we make many notes. So thank you, because <laughs> this is one big uh, um, uh, feedback session for me. And, and basically, you're all, all consultants now of the Dutch government. So, But could you also make a note? Because I think you're right. We have to, see, to look into this what we can do more. I know we, the, the stuff is being done, particularly with uh, Curaçao, uh, but I'm not sure about Aruba. So uh, good question, and we should work on that. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Prime Minister. We were going to end, uh, if you uh, allow the last two students, uh, very short questions, short, and we take the two together. Great. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Liebe. Nice to meet you. I'm Dutch. I think you actually used to teach at my secondary school, Vierde Gymnasium. Mm -hmm. oh. Yes, in Amsterdam, yeah. for one year. And now <laughs> I'm in the Hague at the Jol de Witt uh, School yeah. of Yeah, That's um, great. Yeah. So yeah, my question is, within the context of understanding the need for sanctions, what's your thoughts on the long-term implication of this for Russian civilians? And are you, is there any worries if this is going to feed into more anti-Western sentiments? And maybe a more open-ended question, what, what do you think is next? Where is this going? Thank you. And the last. Hello. Goedemorgen. My name is Michiel. I'm also from the Netherlands. Hey, but typical French exact, name. Yeah. Exact same <laughs> question. So uh, oh. what, what do you think? Uh, do you take in, into consideration the long-term impact that um, uh, economic sanctions that destroy the Russian economy will have on um, the Russian mentality towards yeah. the West? Well, first of all, uh, uh, our fight is not uh, our 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 um, problem is not with the Russian people. It is with Russian leadership, uh, and particularly Putin and his regime. And we have to be very clear about it. And also, by the, by the way, with the regime in Minsk, in Belarus. Um, and I said yesterday on national television in the Netherlands that um, I asked my fellow countrymen and, and, uh, to stop uh, uh, being aggressive uh, in words or even worse towards Russians in the Netherlands uh, because they are as worried as we all are about what is happening in Ukraine and many people in Russia are extremely worried about what is happening in uh, Ukraine but it is unavoidable that sanctions also have an impact indirectly on Russian people for example when you sanction the Russian central bank uh, or take some of the banks out of the SWIFT system but particularly sanction the National Bank of Russia has a huge impact and it leads to queues in, uh, uh, in front of those banks of people uh, waiting in line to withdraw their money and, and it will have many other consequences and if you like uh, from, from not having your McDonald's hamburger to much, more, much more difficult issues like uh, your financial security so this has a this, this will have an impact that's unavoidable uh, but we have all the evidence that the sanctions are working uh, and that more and more senior people in Russia are phoning Vladimir Vladimirovich asking him, yes, of course, we support you, but could you please explain again why this was a good idea? Uh, and we need more of that. And in that sense, we should stick with those sanctions and make sure that uh, we don't let go. We have to maintain that resolve. And yes, that could mean potentially for the longer term. We don't know yet. It could be for the longer term. But I cannot foresee if he would not withdraw from Ukraine that you would have a reset and would say, okay, it is, ah, it is still a bit like Georgia and Crimea, and why would we continue? That cannot happen. Uh, we, we probably collectively have been a bit too naive in those days, and now we have to stick with our resolve and make sure that uh, this stops. Uh, because otherwise, not only for Ukraine, yes, first of all for Ukraine and the people, but also for all of us, because this is a fundamental threat uh, to the post-war uh, security uh, arrangement in the world and and the values the soft values uh, be, be below uh, lying beyond that uh, human rights international legal order uh, and the fact that you do not invade another country and these basic uh, basic values and basic understandings uh, are at risk at the moment if we are not uh, keeping our resolve well, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. This was an extremely uh, in-depth uh, conversation in which you've laid out your vision of uh, reason and resolve. We take your message that we need to do that uh, to keep liberty, sovereignty, democracy. Thank you. Uh, you have an open invitation to return uh, as soon as maybe the environment has changed. Thank you again. Thank you so uh, please uh, thank the Prime Minister. And thanks to all of you. Thank you.